How are y'all? Hey, Mark. Good morning. Morning, church. How are we today? All right. God's made us another day. While you were sleeping last night, he was not. He was uh, weaving. Uh, whoa. I got to that quick. Uh, he was weaving and, and plotting and creating a day for you to inherit. And the faithful of the Lord get to say, I am an inheritor of grace and I'm an inheritor of good things. And God is actively handing me life. Today we're going to be talking about growing in that holiness in Jesus. But the main thing is just to sit with the truth that God the Father loves you so much that he's going to hand you good things, not only for you to grow in Christ. It may not always feel good, but he's going to hand you things that are for his glory and for your benefit. This morning he's already prepared a word to present, a, a time of fellowship, and I'm so glad to see you all here today. Uh, I'm here to encourage you as a pastor Let's give Jesus every single thing he has planned. Let's participate in what he's doing. Can you feel the spirit inside you moving? Let's get to our feet, and let's let, allow that spirit move to produce worship for the kingdom of God. If you will, please join with me as I invite you to stand. Help me as I close this meeting this morning. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the hope.
Please pray with me. Most gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning offering you our praise and thanks for all you have done. We know, Father, that you are both merciful and just. And we thank you, Father, for your perfect mercy offered through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray for your true justice in this world, which only you can provide. As we enter into this time of worship, we give you our hearts, Father, and ask that your Spirit fill us as we pray the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You may be seated. Uh, before we, we uh, commune with Christ at his table, there's a few things I wanted to, to share. This is your civil. Uh, just information for the church. A lot of things have happened this past week, some really great things and some real difficult things. Uh, the boy that was killed at McDonald's, that was shot and killed, 12-year-old boy, had been visiting our youth group the last four or five months. And a uh, really close uh, friend to, to the duty family, Toby and, and Dana. Um, and so Scott's done a fabulous job. Uh, same with Derek at reaching out to them and, and working with them. But uh, that's just difficult news. The, the good news um, is, is how much uh, Damien was connected to Jesus, uh, how much he uh, had happened in his early in his young life. The tragedy is that uh, how many times have how many 12 years have you lived multiplied out? And uh, he only got his 12. Uh, we'll meet him in heaven. We'll be grateful for that moment. Also here to share with you that yesterday afternoon we learned that Jim Bales passed away. Uh, Jim is one of our former staff members and pastors. He was, uh, in many ways, for a season in our church, the, uh, the heart of the ministry uh, for care and, 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 and visiting people. When, in fact, he was with our church through my first year, then he had to resign for health reasons. He physically couldn't go to the hospitals anymore. And then within a short period of time, he himself was in a care uh, facility, and you would go visit him. And even when you went to visit him, he was visiting you. He was asking you about your family, and your, he, by name, asking you how you're doing, how your kids, how's your family. And Jim, is, uh, is his life is going to be celebrated. God's going to be thanked in a couple Saturdays on February 24th in the sanctuary. We'll get you information for that. Uh, Chris <coughs> Armstrong, I don't know if you know Chris, but he's a young man, works at uh, Boys Ranch, about 40 years old, and his family's had a difficult year. Uh, Chris had a brain bleed this week on Tuesday, and it was very scary, and things have turned and looked really up for him. Uh, really, when about 30 minutes, the church began to pray. We put out a Facebook post, the elders' prayer chain went out, and we heard word in 30 minutes that things had turned. So we praise God for that. We, we continue to hope and pray that God will 
further his recovery so he can get back home. Uh, there's probably some things I'm leaving out. There's a lot going on in the life of the church. Whatever you're going through uh, this week, God is at work. God is producing so much goodness through difficulties and so much goodness um, through, uh, through joy. But I want to, one thing that hit me when I was with our elders' prayer meeting this morning, there was a story in the Bible uh, where Jesus was walking with his 12 disciples and they came across a man who was born blind. So he'd never had sight. And his disciples asked the question that everyone seems to ask, who's to blame? Nowadays, we would say, uh, you know, was there a problem in the womb? We try, to, we try to solve from the front end, don't we? we? We only know how to fix the front end and blame from the front end. And so we, they asked questions, you know, who sinned that this man be born blind? His parents, his grandparents, him. Uh, and Jesus said, you know what he said? He, he said, no one sinned that he would be born blind. He said, this man was born blind to reveal the power of God. Whatever your week has looked like, this has been a powerful week for the glory of God. And so if you've had a great week, instead of, you know, why did I have a, why did, am I a better person? Did I work harder? Did I earn this? No. You had a great week so that God's power might be revealed in you. And you may have had a rough week. This may be one of the worst weeks you've had in years. Just stuck or hurt or injured. Why am I going, am I a worse person? Did I mess up? No. It's so that God's glory and power could be revealed in your life. So that whether we live or whether we die, whether we suffer or whether we dance, that God's glory and power be revealed. That's the good news of the church of Jesus Christ, is that in all things, we benefit, God gets glory. And this morning we're here to gather at the table of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only person in the history of humanity that was truly good in all ways and the suffering he endured he chose you hear me because when we ask why do good things ha- bad things happen to good Jesus Christ is the only tr- in every way truly good person suffered the worst and he chose it so that no one can use that broken logic anymore it's not about being good or being bad It's about grace. It's about mercy. It's about the sovereignty of God using every single thing in your life for him, not for you. And so this morning as we focus in on the scriptures, let's focus in first at the table to say, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My whole life, good and bad, I want him to use it. For Jesus did uh, suffer the loss of everything. The scriptures teach that on the night Jesus was to perform his mighty work, beginning with his desertion from his own followers, he first took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you. And every time that you come and you gather and eat from this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And then taking a cup, Jesus praised the Lord, and then he thanked him for this cup, the same cup that he would be asking to pass from him earlier or later in the night. But first he said to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant you have with God, and it is filled with my covenantal blood, which is shed and poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many people. Take and drink, every one of you, and whenever you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to church this morning on this beautiful, cold, crisp Sunday morning here in Hodges Chapel at First Christian Church, in a church we love so much with a family of friends we adore, we come to have communion and to ask you to forgive us of our sins as we drink from this cup and eat this bread we we ask you to help us through the coming week we ask you to forgive our sins as we partake of this communion 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. come forward this morning, you can either replace the cup after you've consumed it, or you can take the cup with you back to your pew. Please come. Father, in the, the holiness of this moment, we remember that you are our beginning and our end. As we, as we open scripture to remember and see the good news, the crown jewel of the gospel, that we have been promised unity with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
as this becomes reality. In Jesus' name, we return all the time, as you've told us to, to the beginning, to start over, to repent with the basics of the gospel. The earliest songs we ever heard are the best songs. Jesus loves me, this I know. This little light of mine. And so we return, Father, to the earliest scripture most of us ever memorized as we proclaim to you the truth, the bedrock, the gospel of the world. Please join me, church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. The children are dismissed if they choose for a tabernacle time. Y'all sound great, by the way. Our uh, scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6. I think they've been taken, two of them. Romans chapter 6. Um, may God's blessing by the Holy Spirit bless the reading, the hearing, and understanding of these words because these are from St. Paul, and we need help with St. Paul sometimes because his teaching is like one run-on sentence for like an entire chapter. So I'm serious about this. May God bless the reading of these words that they become inside of us and may the spirit within you say amen when you hear it. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I'll repeat that. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin now if we died with Christ we believe that we will also live with Christ for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life Jesus lives, he lives to God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, may your Holy Spirit preach this morning. May it preach from the inside out. May you stir up thoughts and feelings and, and connections in the heart of your church and every believer in here, Lord. And may my job be as well to put words to what's happening within. But may the true preaching happen in the heart. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was 18, uh, <coughs> I was skinny. was why are you laughing it's true uh, I was wiry and I would go to the city pool all the time I was one of those kids that wore a stole of a robe around your remember when you could just walk down the street and go to the pool with two quarters to go to the pool so I go to the pool and if they didn't take your two quarters then you could buy a Hawaiian punch and I'd go to the pool with my brothers and all my friends would be there and that's how you spent your summer and uh, the goal of going to the pool was not to look at girls. See, I wasn't that old yet. The goal of going to the pool was to dunk and not be dunked. Can I get an amen? amen. 
to dunk and not be dunked. I was really good at it. I, I joked in first service that my, some people say you're a draft, and I say, no, I'm, I'm a praying mantis. That's, <laughs> that's how I play basketball, too, just get long and, you know. Um, and so, you know, I could keep people at bay, and I could turn, and, you know, you're wiry and you're tall. So um, that's how I spent my summer. Well, uh, time marched on, and I was now 18, and uh, too cool for the pool. And I was running uh, because that's what I did. That was my thing. I still love to run. And I hope that the, the thing you were doing when you met Jesus, you still do if it's healthy. If it's healthy. Um, I was running. And uh, Jesus practically jumped out of the bushes and dunked me for the first time in my life. Uh, if you've never been dunked by Jesus, you can't stop him. You can't be wiry enough to get out of his grasp, his, his grasp. And the way he dunks is he doesn't come in front of you. He comes behind you and grabs you. And it may have happened the day you were physically dunked in the baptistry at church. For me, it happened on Northgate in Irving, Texas, near the old Texas, the real Texas stadium. And he grabbed me from behind, and he pulled me back, and then he sprung me forward. You can get baptized in a church. The church is only authorized to baptize you with the baptism of St. John, baptism for repentance. But there is one who would come after John, who would baptize you in, water, in fire and in spirit, and his name's Jesus. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus, an outward expression of an inward baptism. That's what matters. Romans 6 preaches this baptism. What Romans 6 is telling us, and where I'd like us to sit, yes, for seven weeks, but really I think for the rest of the year, is that if you've been baptized in Jesus, you are now united with Jesus. And you are destined beyond your power to stop it, to in the end, glow with the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are designed and destined by his work in your life to express his holiness into the world. That's what you're designed to do. This morning, I wanted us to start this series with a couple just truths to, to grab hold of, but it's, it's a series based on holiness. Um, letting the Lord produce in you a, a, a booming, uh, redemptive, part of your life that maybe you haven't discovered yet. And every one of us has parts of our lives that Jesus is still at work in to redeem. Every one of us has something that God is going to be pointing at this season and saying, you've, I love you, and you've obeyed me, and all these things, even though you're imperfect and obedience is always not perfectly executed. But this year, I'm going to heal your inability to love well. I'm going to heal your lack of generosity. I, Jesus, not the church, not the pastor, Jesus is going to heal the numbness you have toward the Word of God. He's going to heal the way that you take communion without looking at the face of Jesus. He's going to heal something in your life, hopefully some things in your life, and redeem things that haven't been redeemed in you. And you've got to start off by saying, I am saved by grace, but there's part of my life that hasn't been fully redeemed yet. What's been paid for hasn't come out fruit-wise yet. We're all imperfect, right? I can just say that. So number one is, first thing I wanted to tell you this morning, there's really only three things. First one is that the Church of Jesus Christ the crown jewel of the gospel is that Jesus has a church that's been so redeemed in him and so united with him that when the world looks at us, we look like Jesus. And the only way you can look like Jesus is if you're able to look at Jesus. And that's the number one growth spot the Lord's working in in our church right now. We have a beholding problem. We have a beholding problem. Uh, one of the great... Uh, 
uh, signs of this is that <coughs> we can attend church or someone's baptism, uh, and if we're in a bad mood, come on, I'm a preacher. I I have some, now sometimes I'm in a bad mood too, I'm not perfect, but sometimes I'm just full of the Spirit, I'm just moving the Spirit, and, it's, oh my gosh. and then I have somebody waiting for me after church saying, I didn't like that hymn. Like, are you kidding me? Or, it's too cold in here, the dude just got baptized. Like, he's going to heaven. You see? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not beating up on anyone because we've all, right, we've all attended church with a bad mood. We've all attended church camp with a bad mood. We've all attended the Bible with a bad mood. We've all gone to bed with our spouse in a bad mood. The, the tragedy is that simul- two things are true. We can be in the physical presence of holy things and not act in a holy way. We can be in the presence of the Lord's Supper, emblems blessed by the Holy Spirit, in the presence of Jesus' covenant, but body and blood for us, and depending on our attitude, eh. Right? That's tragic. That's what God is overcoming. That's what revival looks like, is a hunger and a connection to Jesus Christ through the things of Jesus Christ. It's nothing new. I need fog machines in here. I need Jesus in here. And so this is an entire series about how does a person behold Jesus? How do you do that? Next, starting next week, we're going to look at three different phases that are biblical that God moves in to keep us attached to him and to keep us unstuck from laying down like dry bones. And it's all based on the belief that your job, your only job, your core thing is to look at Jesus so that you can start to look like Jesus. Have you heard the concept, whatever you behold, you become? Do you ever uh, open your mouth and your dad comes out or your mom comes out? It's because the first 18 years of your life, you beheld your parents. Whatever you behold, you be. I, I remember when uh, President Obama uh, was president for eight years. The first three years. I watched the whole country talk like Obama. It was the weirdest thing. The, the, the weird, Kate, everyone talks different. I'm not against Obama, whatever, you know, I'm not political. But I just noticed that when you have one person you're listening to, you, you kind of emulate, right? Whatever you behold, you become. I've been watching a lot of Matt Chandler, so I'm doing a lot of this. Right? Yeah. So, Whatever we behold, we become. What are you looking at? What have you been beholding? Who is coming out of you? This is a series about the fight to keep Jesus through the Holy Spirit as your object of affection, as your beholding piece. So number one is that you are designed and destined to be united with Jesus in every single way. That's where it's headed. Why not participate in it now? He's going to redeem every part of your, your, your being. He's going to resurrect you. He loves you. You're going to heaven. There's no stopping that. He is yours and you are his. The question is, are you going to live according to your former life or are you going to live according to your future life? Are you going to be living according to the guy that's dead in the baptistry that, that should be buried underground that keeps coming back last dance with Mary Jane style? Or are you... Are you living according to who you're going to be forever in the resurrection, Jesus. That's, that's what holiness is all about. So number one is that you're destined for this. Number two is that God has placed inside of every single believer, and I don't care if you go to a hardcore Pentecostal church or a frozen chosen Presbyterian church, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and regenerated and born again, you have within you the very Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You have the power of the resurrection inside of you. That's guaranteed. That's how you got faith. That's how so many things have occurred in you. And, and when you hear truth being preached, sometimes you get butterflies. Sometimes you, I get the weird stomach feeling. The Spirit of God is inside His church, not because you want it, because God wants it. He will be worshipped in spirit and truth. And what God wants, He gets. You get to benefit from it, 
But God's the one that does it. He's placed his spirit inside of you. And here's one lie I want to just deal with real quick up front that's gotten into my heart that's not true. I've been uh, lied to by the world, by my flesh, by whoever, by the devil, and it's this false belief when you're feeling badly. Right now, have y'all felt bad? You just, you're a Christian, but you feel bad? Where's my hand? You feel, sometimes you feel bad? Okay, you're grieving, you, you got flu, you just, you're not feeling it, uh, whatever. But you just don't feel good. There's this false voice that will say, now, Fabian, you did have the Holy Spirit. Did have the Holy Spirit. You did have a phenomenal, I'm not going to argue the point with you uh, on whether or not you had that encounter or not. That was true, but this lie will say, but for some reason you don't have it anymore. The most dangerous doctrines are the amended promises of God. That's the work of the evil one, to take a word of God and tweak it and then present it back to you. I'd rather hear a straight-up lie than an amended word of God. The word of God says that wherever the Holy Spirit enters into, that Holy Spirit does not leave. The Spirit of God is inside his church, never to leave always to stay. God has taken over your life. There is new management, y'all. You ain't in charge anymore. God put his spirit inside of you, and that's the way it is. Now, whether you're experiencing the warm fuzzies and experiencing the manifestations and the graces of the Holy Spirit, and you're feeling like you're, you're flying like you're at church camp, or if you feel like you're at the DMV waiting to get your, your uh, license renewed, whatever you're, I mean, depending on where you are in life, your feelings doesn't change God's promises. Never has been the case. What you feel is not what God, it, it, your feelings don't have the power to change God's promise. You're not that powerful. You're not that powerful. The concept of unconditional grace and unconditional love is absolutely true when it's pl- applied to an object of grace. If you've received the grace of God, you can't stop that his grace is going to keep flowing. It's unconditional. His presence in your life is You're not that powerful. If he's decided that he's going to be glorified by saving you, then he's decided that he's going to be glorified by saving you. Where are you in that equation? You're just another bozo on the bus. You're just having a blast. That's where you get to start. My feelings, God can change, but my feet, God can change my feelings, but my feelings don't change God, you see? And, And that's what's so important. Because what is going to take place in the life of a believer and in the life of a revival is the Spirit of Jesus inside of the Christians doing the work. If you try to look like Jesus without the Holy Spirit, you're going to turn Jesus into a motivational speaker and not your Savior. You're going to get crushed by the expectation, who the heck can live like Jesus? apart from the Holy Spirit. No one can, apart from Christ's own Spirit. And that's where we get this teaching from Romans 6 that starts off by saying, I've been dead with Christ, and now that I'm alive in Christ, it's not my own power, it's not my own strength. I'm a new person because of His work inside of me. I need to stay connected to the One in whom I have my resurrection. And so as we go through this series, you're going to hear a lot about the Holy Spirit. This is critical. I don't know what kind of church you were raised in, but the third member of the Trinity, it's awesome. This is how it works. From eternity, the Father, and everything is normally written from the perspective of the Father. The Father has an object of affection called the Son. The Father loves the Son, the lover, the beloved. And the way the Father loves the Son is by pouring the Holy Spirit, which is His love, into this object of affection. Over and over and over, the Holy Spirit never runs out, consistently pours out, always fresh, always new. And Jesus, out of all the members of the Trinity, Jesus is the one that substituted us for Him and Him for us, right? So that Jesus has grabbed you and pulled you up on his throne. He's made room for you on his throne. He's set you down so that you can get a water hydrant soaking of the Holy Spirit that's been available to Jesus from the beginning. That's how it works. 
It's a mystery. It's something to be apprehended, if you, even if you can't comprehend it, that you have become chosen, moved, saved, however, whatever word you want to use, for the crown jewel of the gospel, and that is this, that the same love that the Father has for the Son, He can have for you. No difference. Because when Jesus, when the Father sees you, He sees Jesus. And he loves you like he loves Jesus. Now I hear, uh, real quick, I hear a lot of preaching about the unconditional love of God, the uncon- and they're talking about for the whole world. No, 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 you have to be in Christ. He has to see Jesus on you, then it's, it's game on, right? If he doesn't see Jesus on you, then hey, you know, I don't want to talk about hell today, but you know, Jesus talks about it more than anybody else. But for the redeemed of the Lord, we have been given not only the promise but the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you up front, the Holy Spirit wants to be active in your life more than you want Him to be active in your life. He wants to preach Christ more than you do. He wants to reveal glory. He loves to reveal truth more than you're ready. And so the problem isn't Him. It's who? It's us. It's resistance. It's allowing the dead guy that lived before to live now. Don't let him live anymore. Call your flesh, call your intellect, call your memories that are off worthy of the cross which Christ has given you to place them upon and start living in the Spirit. So number one, you are designed and destined to be united with your groom, Jesus. You are designed for him to walk up and lift the veil and kiss you, to see clearly. And the way he's going to do this is by the power of his Holy Spirit which is already inside you. So real quick, Repeat after me. I have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. and nothing can change that. Can change Not, even me. Not even me. Okay. That if, you, if you can't stand on that, if you can't believe that, the rest of these shit just doesn't make any sense. So that's where you have to start. God's promises are what put the bit in my mouth, not what I'm feeling. And God's promise that the Holy Spirit is inside of his temple, which is your heart, Never to leave. He got what he came for. You. You're his treasure. You're his trophy. You you being saved brings him glory. Done deal. Which brings us to number three. This is a series about fighting. This is a series about fighting. St. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race, the course. He says uh, earlier that I am like a boxer and I don't just beat at the wind, James. I land punches. I make it rain. I make it happen. This is a series about fighting. Because this isn't about fighting in a war. This isn't about fighting uh, to whip yourself like a masochist. This is not fighting to, to not have pleasure in life because God loves you to have pleasure with him. This is about fighting for one thing. To have a laser beam focus on the Spirit of God to connect you with the Son of God, your Savior. He is ready and willing to redeem parts of your life that you have not even considered handing to Him. There are people in this church that have been struck early in life with the strength of generosity. There are people in the church that haven't been Generous. I mean, we, just because you give two bucks at the at the the, the, uh, the checkout line every Sunday, or whenever you're there, what is that? Eighteen dollars a year. Whoop de do. Right? When the Holy Spirit wells up in a person, generosity, love, marriage, these things start to take off in a crazy fashion because it's no longer you who live, but the Holy Spirit in you. And the, the way this redemption, the way this growth, the way these things are going to take place, is by fighting to say. I'm not going to listen to anybody except Jesus. I'm not going to take my orders from anybody, any preacher, any motivational speaker out but Jesus. I'm going to fight. There's a clip I wanted to show, but I thought about it too late and I couldn't get it to Brittany, but do we have any Seinfeld fans in here? Okay. You got to go look this one up. You got to go look. Maybe we'll show it next week. But this was like striking me. Uh, as I was thinking about this series last night, um, there's a, 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 an episode where Kramer runs back to Jerry's apartment. He's all excited because he's seen Joe DiMaggio 
at the at the uh, uh, coffee shop. And first off, no one believes him. He says, "Oh yeah, he was there." Also, he's a dunker. He dunks his donuts. And like, no, if he doesn't dunk his donuts, he's like, yes, he does. And not only does he dunk his donuts, you cannot break his focus. Kramer says he dunks his donuts like he played baseball. The Yankee Clipper, you know. <laughs> you cannot break this guy's focus. And so, get yeah, seriously, go look up this episode. True story. And so Kramer, although it's a show, Kramer is here in the coffee shop, and whenever Joe DiMaggio is across the way dunking donuts, Kramer's trying to break his focus. He starts slamming on the table, seeing if he could break this guy. It's just amazing how this guy never looks up. And then, and then if that doesn't work, he starts yelping. Yoop, yoop, yoop. <laughs> Y'all seen the episode. He starts slamming the table. And he's like, it's crazy how focused this guy is. Well, the episode ends. They're all at the coffee shop. And, and Jerry and Elaine and George are like, oh, my, there's Joe DiMaggio. He's actually here. And they're just like, go get your donuts. What does Kramer do? Boosh, boosh. <laughs> Trying to break this guy's focus. It's a great episode. It's real funny. But the point is, what could happen in your life if you figured out what the goal of life is and then had a single-minded focus? What would it look like if you said, I, my fight, my job is not to be the best mother. My job is not to be the whatever, whatever winning could look like because the target seems to move all the time, doesn't it? Because right now it, it's to be the most uh, pure. If, if you get caught doing any sin, particularly sexual sin, you're done. In this country, am I, amen? The target moves all the time. I don't know what's next, but it's like, I can't play that game. I can't keep up with self-righteousness based on this culture. The, the, the topics of what manhood looks like. I mean, the, the, the hipsters, you're not a hipster, Caleb, even though we've made fun of you before. But <laughs> I did happen to look right at you when I said that. Is it beards? Is it no beards? Is it sensitive? Is it is it is it uh, David Hasselhoff, right? What? the moving targets of what people are supposed to be will drive you crazy and exhausted. And the good news is, is your job is to continue to look at Jesus. That you would continue to look like Jesus. The church has been authorized with this union. We're going to preach in a few weeks that you are the letter that Jesus is writing to the world. Nobody calls the church hypocrites when we're looking at Mother Teresa. No one will call the church hypocrites as a, per, as a person is looking, beholding the glory of Jesus and behaving accordingly. This is the fight. This is your fight. This is your sin. And at some point in your life, there's going to be a, a gathering of people and they're going to come forward and there's going to be a casket there and you're going to be in that casket. You won't be. But your vehicle will, will be. People are going to tell stories. The preacher's going to get up there. He may do a good job. He may not. We don't know. What's the best thing that somebody could say about you? He looked like Jesus. She looked like Jesus. Let's look like Jesus. Father, by the power of the cross, by the power of the resurrection, and by the crown jewel, the power of the Holy Spirit, which has united every child of God through faith to your kingdom, we call out, we pray, that you would stir within us an affection and an ability to behold Jesus like we've never been able to do before. Lord, we thank you for what you've paid for. We submit to your glory, and we ask in Jesus' name, that you would live in us and not our flesh, that you would be preached and not ourselves, that people would meet you, they wouldn't meet us. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing, this is an opportunity. If anyone would like to join our church, I'll be forward if you'd like to come forward and receive the right hand of Christian fellowship.
thank you for another chance to sing the truth. We thank you for the word of God. And we do pray that what is preached outwardly would be radiated and true within. That your spirit would produce in us a hunger for holiness, a hunger for Jesus. May it be based on desire and not just obligation. May we want you and may you make us want you better. Lord, when we sin and if we sin, may we be crushed when we think, I wish I wanted Jesus as much as I want that thing. Take away our desires for lesser things and give us a heart for Christ alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jonna, do you have a, a quick announcement? If you feel a calling, if your heart says that that's what you would like to do, please come find me. Um, also, we are entering into the season of Lent. And this is a season where we're asking our members to be intentional about practicing love, which is the devotional you're going to get as we leave today. Ash Wednesday kicks off this Wednesday, which is actually Valentine's Day. I think it's ironic and intentional that we have been talking about the greatest love that was poured into us is from um, God. And so what a wonderful way of celebrating Valentine's. So join us for our Ash Wednesday service at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary. Also, this devotional is intentional for anyone and everyone, including families, college students, single people, couples. But we're really encouraging our families to jump in and do this together um, every night or every day, whatever works for you. Also, just want to let you know that love starts at the home. And 1 John says, let us love not just in words and speech, but in action and truth. So don't just open up this season with one day of participating in love. Let this be a season where you practice love all through the year. So you'll be getting those on the way out. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, a couple more things. Uh, tonight, 5 o'clock, get back here for Chili Cook-Off and for Bingo. It's really quite fun, and the church needs to have fun together. So come have fun, and that'll be fun. Uh, also, again, Wednesday night, uh, please, uh, this year, try to make it part of your, your Lenten experience. Uh, bring your Valentine's Day to church. We'll put ashes on him or her and you, and then you go have your lunch or your dinner, and everyone can look at you weird. But this is, a, this is an opportunity, a great service to remember where we're destined without the intervention of Jesus. And the only hope we have is in the work of Christ alone. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, please come back next week. We'll continue on with this series. And I'll be praying for you. I know you're praying for me, for us all to continue to grow in Christ likeness. Join me now for our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his own face and shine upon you and grant you the peace of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>